Sir John A. Macdonald's speech during the Confederation debates on federalism. Now, as regards the competitive advantage of a legislative and a federal union, I have never hesitated to state my own opinions. I have again and again stated in the House that, if practicable, I thought a legislative union would be preferable. I have always contended that if we could agree to have one government and one parliament legislating for the whole of these peoples, it would be the best, the cheapest, the most vigorous, and the strongest system of government we could adopt. But on looking at the subject of the conference and discussing the matter as we did, most unreservedly and with a desire to arrive at a satisfactory conclusion, we found that such a system was impracticable. In the first place, it would not meet the assent of the people of Lower Canada, because they felt, in their particular position, being a minority with a different language, nationality and religion from the majority, in case of a junction with the other provinces, their institutions and their laws might be assailed, and their ancestral associations, on which they prided themselves, attacked and prejudiced. It was found that any proposition which involved the absorption of the individuality of Lower Canada, if I may use the expression, would not be received with favor by her people. We found, too, that though their people speak the same language and enjoy the same system of law as the people of Upper Canada, a system founded on the common law of England, there was as great a disinclination on the part of the various maritime provinces to lose their individuality as separate political organizations as we observed in the case of Lower Canada herself. Therefore, we were forced to the conclusion that we must either abandon the idea of union altogether, or devise a system of union in which the separate provincial organizations would be in some degree preserved. The conference having come to the conclusion that a legislative union, pure and simple, was impracticable, our next attempt was to form a government upon federal principles, which would give the general government the strength of a legislative and administrative union, while at the same time it preserved that liberty of action for the different sections which is allowed by a federal union. And I am strong in the belief that we have hit upon the happy medium in those resolutions, and that we have formed a scheme of government which unites the advantages of both, giving us the strength of a legislative union and the sectional freedom of a federal union, with protection to local interests. In doing so, we had the advantage of the experience of the United States. We can now take advantage of the experience of the last 78 years, during which the Constitution has existed, and I am strongly of the belief that we have, in a great measure, avoided in this system which we propose for the adoption of the people of Canada, the defects in which time and events have shown to exist in the American Constitution. Ever since the Union was formed, the difficulty of what is called state rights has existed, and this has much to do in bringing on the present unhappy war in the United States. They commenced, in fact, at the wrong end. They declared by their constitution that each state was a sovereignty in itself, and that all the powers incident to a sovereignty belonged to each state, except those powers which, by the constitution, were conferred upon the general government and Congress. Here we have adopted a different system. We have strengthened the general government. We have given the general legislature all the great subjects of legislation. We have conferred on them, not only specifically and in detail, all the powers which are incident to sovereignty, but we have expressly declared that all subjects of general interest, not distinctly and exclusively conferred upon the local governments and local legislatures, shall be conferred upon the general government and legislature. We have thus avoided that great source of weakness which has been the cause of the disruption of the United States. We have avoided all conflict of jurisdiction and authority, and if this constitution is carried out, we will have in fact, as I said before, all the advantages of a legislative union under one administration with, at the same time, the guarantees for local institutions and for local laws, which are insisted upon by so many in the provinces now, I hope, to be united. Any honorable member on examining the list of different subjects which are to be assigned to the general and local legislatures respectively will see that all the great questions which affect the general interests of the Confederacy as a whole are confided to the federal parliament while the local interests and local laws of each section are preserved intact and entrusted to the care of the local bodies. As a matter of course, 
The general parliament must have the power of dealing with the public debt and property of the confederation. Of course, too, it must have the regulation of trade and commerce, of customs and excise. The federal parliament must have the sovereign power of raising money from such sources and by such means as the representatives of the people will allow. It will be seen that the local legislatures have the control of all local works, and it is a matter of great importance and one of the chief advantages of the federal union and of local legislatures, that each province will have the power and means of developing its own resources and aiding its own progress after its own fashion and in its own way. Therefore, all the local improvements, all local enterprises or undertakings of any kind, have been left to the care and management of the local legislatures of each province. With respect to the local governments, it is provided that each shall be governed by a chief executive officer, who shall be nominated by the general government. As this is to be one united province, with the local governments and legislature subordinate to the general government and legislature, it is obvious that the chief executive officer in each of the provinces must be subordinate as well. The general government assumes toward the local governments precisely the same position as the imperial government holds with respect to each of the colonies now so that as lieutenant governor of each of the different provinces is now appointed directly by the queen and is directly responsible and reports directly to her, so will the executives of the local governments hereafter be subordinate to the representative of the queen and be responsible and report to him. In conclusion, I would again implore the House not to let this opportunity pass. It is an opportunity that may never recur. At the risk of repeating myself, I would say, it was only by a happy concurrence of circumstances that we were enabled to bring this great question to its present position. If we do not take advantage of the time, if we show ourselves unequal to the occasion, it may never return, and we shall hereafter bitterly and unavailingly regret having failed to embrace the happy opportunity now offered of founding a great nation under the fostering care of Great Britain and our sovereign lady, Queen Victoria. <laughs>